Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming out to Town Hall tonight. My name is Bob Redmond. I'm the program director, and I'm excited to uh, introduce our special program tonight. It's part of a national series of debates on first principles presented by Demos and the Ayn Rand Institute as part of Town Hall Center for Civic Life Programming. The topic of tonight's debate is government, what's its proper role? And it features David Callahan of Demos and your own Brooke of the Ayn Rand Center. Tonight's debate will be moderated by Seattle native John McKay, who grew up on Capitol Hill and attended St. Joseph's Grade School, Seattle Prep High School, and the University of Washington. He served as United States Attorney under George W. Bush from 2001 to 2007, when he resigned along with eight other U.S. attorneys. Following that, McKay joined the faculty of Seattle University School of Law, where he continues to teach. I want to turn the proceedings over to him now, and he's going to introduce our debaters and tell you exactly how the evening will proceed. Thank you again for coming. Please give a warm town hall welcome to First Principles Debate. Good evening, everyone. I'm John McKay. It's my privilege this evening to be here at Seattle's Town Hall, here in the Great Hall, and to welcome you to what is now the fifth in a series of national debates on very important topics, and tonight to talk about the role of government. In fact, our title is Government, What's It Good For? That may be a provocative line uh, for our two debaters, and we're privileged to have with us here tonight First, uh, David Callahan here to your left. He is the co-founder and senior fellow of Demos, uh, a think tank public policy group based in New York. Uh, he is an author, like our second debater tonight. He is a commentator and lecturer. Uh, his books, uh, in particular, The Cheating Culture and the Moral Center, uh, are tremendous commentaries. Uh, worthy of your consideration. He is a graduate of Hampshire College and he holds a PhD in politics from Princeton University. We'll talk some more about some of the positions that uh, he has advocated and that Demos has advocated and I'm sure he will bring some of those to your attention as well. Uh, to my left, uh, to your right, is Jeroen Brook. He is the uh, executive director of the Ayn Rand Institute. It is, of course, a well-known nonprofit organization uh, advancing the ideas of objectivism. Uh, he is a, himself a tremendous uh, intellect and writer as well, publisher and commentator. So we have two uh, very engaging debaters tonight. And uh, we were talking beforehand that, that we're hoping that our debate, uh, we're not using as the yardstick the presidential debates, just to put you all... <laughs> All at ease. What, what, what we hope for tonight is engagement, engagement on important ideas, important issues. Uh, we have two tremendous protagonists here, and we're asking all of you to participate as well, which is, which is a tradition here at Town Hall. So we will have uh, plenty of opportunity and time for questions from all of you for our, our, tremendous, our tremendous debaters. I'd like to jump right in to our discussion tonight, and my role will be simply to, to move this along uh, to various topics, but not to be afraid to linger on important topics, as our debaters may determine them to be and as you may determine them to be. Uh, if we rip from the headlines today, uh, I hate to say that the first issue would be one that I think could only be characterized as failure. And uh, I'm referring, of course, to the Joint Committee looking at the, the question of the reduction of United States debt and the failure of the Joint Committee and the announced failure by both parties of that partisan committee. And I think that might be an interesting place to start on what the role of government is and should be in our, in our society. So we'll jump into that question and give you each an opportunity to open in the context of that question. So we want to give each of our, of our debaters an opportunity to speak. We'll leave that question in the background. You may address it as you open it, or we'll address it as you finish. And so, David, we want to turn to you first, and you may uh, make five minutes or so of an opening statement. Great. <coughs> well, it's great to be here tonight. 
So this is my fourth appearance at Town Hall Seattle. And uh, as always, I'm thankful to the fantastic team that makes these events possible. A town hall is truly one of the best venues for public discussion in the country. And I've been to a lot of them, so thank you. Now, on my previous visits to town hall, I was the only person up here on the stage. <laughs> and while it's certainly fun to be a uh, monopoly provider like that, I'm also looking forward to tonight. The role of government is the central issue of our time and our politics. And I'm thrilled to be here to make the case for a public sector that is strong, that is effective, and that can advance the common good. So let me just quickly sketch out the way I see things. For starters, the question here tonight, the real question, is not what should government be doing, as if government were some autonomous entity with its own agenda. The real question is what do we, as citizens, want to do through government? This is a democracy, after all. Government is our common tool to get things done. Government is us. It's a tool we use when we want to do things that we can't do as individuals, that we can't do through the free market, and that we can't do through civil society or charity. The best way to, to think about government is as a set of public structures that we have built to make society better for everyone. And in a great many ways, the story of America's success and prosperity over the past century is a story of how we together have built these public structures and expanded the role of government to improve our lives. I'll talk about a bunch of those good things tonight, but let me flag two major and overarching roles for government. First, we use government to protect ourselves. Protection is a fundamental role of the state, and it goes beyond protecting ourselves from street criminals or from foreign terrorists. We've also turned to government to protect ourselves from other things, like uh, contaminated food and pollution. Americans no longer die in droves from foodborne diseases, as they did before the creation of the FDA in 1906. We no longer choke on the air that we breathe in our cities. We also use government to protect ourselves from unscrupulous business practices. Government protects us, or should protect us, from being ripped off in financial frauds, or exploited by usurious lenders, or tricked by false advertising, or harmed by defective consumer products. And government protects us in other ways. It protects us in the workplace. A century ago, 100,000 workers died every five years on the job, often because employers didn't really care whether they died. At a time when there was only 40 million people in the labor force. Today, 5,000 workers die a year in a labor force, which is f much larger. Because of government, too, fewer Americans are dying on our highways. Since the federal government stepped in to regulate auto safety in 1966, the auto fatality rate has dropped by 400 percent. Seatbelts, airbags, regulated by government, mandated by government, have saved hundreds of thousands of lives. Americans want government to play this protective role. But for decades now, powerful interests have been working to destroy these protections, often to increase their own bottom line. This helps explain why uh, investors lost trillions of dollars when Wall Street was allowed to turn into a casino, why so many Americans have lost their homes to predatory lending, why so much air pollution still persists, causing asthma, lung cancer, heart disease. When government watchdogs are sleeping or when they've been put to sleep, bad things happen. And yet all of this bad stuff apparently is not enough. And there are politicians trying to strip away even more of these protections, trying to kill the FDA, trying to kill the EPA, trying to kill OSHA. 
We'll come back to all of that later, I'm sure. A second major role for government, again, a role that we have chosen together as citizens, is to help build a stronger economy and ensure prosperity for everyone. Look, capitalism is a great system for creating wealth, but it can also be a phenomenally harsh and brutal system. A system that allows some people to live like kings and leaves others to starve on the street. As well, it can be a very unstable system, prone to booms and busts. This is not the kind of society Americans want. Yes, we believe in economic freedom. We want to use the market and business to build wealth, to build personal autonomy, to realize our dreams. But we also believe in mutual obligation and taking care of each other. And as a society, ideally, we try to manage capitalism through government to get the best of both worlds, to get the prosperity and the freedom, but also the fairness and the security. And we haven't been doing that very well lately. We haven't been getting the best of both worlds lately in that way, because government has been too weak. And the evidence of this is everywhere around us. Too many Americans live in poverty. Too many Americans are unemployed. Too many don't have health care. Too many can't afford college. And all this at a time when the top 1% have more wealth than the bottom 90% of Americans put together. That is not okay. It's not the kind of country we want to live in. It's not the country that the founders envisioned. We can do better, and government offers us a way to do better together. So I'm going to come back to that super committee question. Yeah. Let, let, me, let me ask it for you in the context of, of, of your remarks. You've talked about the weakness of government. It seems that perhaps in the Joint Select Committee on Deficit Reduction, an enormous amount of power, at least on the surface, seemed to have flowed into that committee. But it's been a failure. Are we, when, you, when you say the government is weak, would we, would we strengthen something that, when given power, seems to fail? The super committee was a failure because the Republican Party has been taken over by anti-government ideologues who are implacably opposed to raising taxes under almost any circumstances, despite the fact that taxes are at their lowest level in 60 years as a percentage of GDP, and we're facing the retirement of the boomers. That is why the super committee failed. It is not about the, the problems of government structurally. It is about the Republican Party has lost its mind. Well, let me, let me turn... Let me turn then. Let me let me turn to Mr. Brook and 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 also in the context of your opening statement, if you wish, to address the failure that I have have mentioned. But we want to give you an opportunity to open as well. Sure, I'd be I'd be happy to. So first, uh, this is my first appearance in town hall. So thank you for inviting me. Hopefully, it won't be my last, but you'll have to let me know afterwards, right? <laughs> I, I I have a feeling David's more at home here than I am, but. I would like to be at home here. You are very welcome here. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. I'd also like to thank uh, Demos uh, for participating in these events and our, our, uh, our moderator tonight uh, for being willing to, to moderate this discussion. I want to I take a step back a little bit. Uh, you know, I think we'll get into all the different concrete issues that David has brought up, and I, I'm eager to comment on all of them. I probably won't get a chance tonight to comment on even half of them. But uh, I'd like to take a step back, because I'd like to ask the more fundamental question of why do we need government? What is it for? And is there something unique about this country and the experiment that is America? Because I believe there is. I believe in the 18th century, thinkers of the time, and the founding fathers in particular, faced a crucial turning point in human history. They had to decide who each one of our lives belongs to. Is your life the property of a king? Is your life the property of a tribe? The property of a group, of a collective, of a democracy? Is your life the property of someone else. Because that's the way human beings have been living 
forever. Before 1776, all countries, you as an individual, didn't count. You didn't. You belonged. You, you were responsible to some other entity above and beyond you as an individual. What the Enlightenment did and what the founding fathers established is the first country in human history where that was not true. The country was established with the idea that your life belongs to you. Not to the Pope, not to the King, not to your neighbor, not to any group. Nice group, bad group, doesn't matter. Your life is not owned by the tribe, it is yours. It is yours to live as you please. The founding fathers, this country was established on a moral principle. On the moral principle of individualism. On the idea that we are autonomous entities that have a moral right to our own life. A moral right to our own ideas. A moral right to pursue our own happiness. Uninfringed by majorities, by popes, by anybody. Now, how do we live a life like that? How do we fulfill that individualism? How do we live in a society where everybody's pursuing their own interests in a harmonious way? Well, the founders, following John Locke, had a really a concept for this. They called it individual rights. The idea was that if you lived your life the way you wanted to live it, pursuing your own values, pursuing your own life, pursuing your own happiness. That was okay as long as you didn't use force against your neighbor, as long as you didn't impede your neighbor's ability to do the same. So we all have individual rights. We all have to have this right to pursue our dream, our happiness, our values. But we need an entity to prevent us from using force against one another, because we know throughout human history, unfortunately, we're a pretty bloody race, right? People, people use force all the time. And that is what this particular government was instituted to do, to protect us from our neighbor who might decide to steal our stuff, to defraud us, to take stuff away from us. That is the role of government, to protect our right to life liberty, property, and the pursuit of happiness. That requires a very small government. That requires a government that just does policing, military, judiciary, and leaves us alone otherwise. Leaves us alone to pursue our lives. Because once a government starts trying to do all the things that David would like them to do, they have to start infringing on my right. Now, let's say there is a really good cause out there. Right? People, you know, people need more health care. People are not getting the best health care they could otherwise get. There are only two options, ultimately, to get me to help them. One is to ask. That's the system I like. A voluntary system where my rights are respected, where I get to make the choice of who to help and who not to help, under what conditions to help them, under what conditions not to help them. The only other choice is to force me to do it. And that is a violation of my right. That is a violation of my right to life. That is taking property away from me and using it in a way that I do not want to use it or that I have not chosen to use it. And that is fundamentally wrong. It's wrong when we do it to each other. We call it stealing. It's equally wrong when we get a group of people in a room and vote 51% to take my money away. It's still stealing. It's still wrong. It's still a violation of my rights. It's still exactly the kind of government the Founding Fathers warned us against the kind of government that tries to tell people how to live, what to do with their money, who to help and who not to help. So I approach this issue, my approach to this issue is very simple. Government should do one thing and one thing only. It should do it really well. 
and it should be as big as it needs to be to do this one thing really well, and that is protect our individual rights, and it should do nothing else, everything else, all the wonderful goals that David might have for society out there should be achieved or not by voluntary association of individuals pursuing their own life and their own happiness. So, in terms of the super committee, let me go a failure. way up there. A failure, a failure perhaps. Uh, in, so in my view, the failure is not the failure of the super committee. The failure is the failure of a hundred years of a mixed economy that has brought us to the brink of bankruptcy. The failure is administration after administration, spending money on things the government should have never been spending money on to begin with. The failure is a failure of spending money that we don't have. The notion that somehow government should be allowed to borrow everything all the time, as much as they want, whenever they want it, which leads to Greece. It leads to destruction. It leads to chaos. But more importantly and more fundamentally, it leads to the violation of each one of our, right, our rights, our life, to live our right to live our life in the best way that we choose to live our life. The system we have today is a system of autocrats dictating how and what and where we should live. And yeah, in some, in some very narrow fields you can aggregate the numbers and say, somebody's better off. But what if I'm not better off? I don't accept the right of the government to dictate that. So to me, the Sioux Company is a little technicality on the way. Yes, they failed. It's a little funny to blame it all on Republicans. Uh, when, the, when the problem clearly of... Do you, do you blame today, both? Would you blame both parties? No. I, I take it in the cutest. No, I mean, I'm not going to defend Republicans. Republicans are awful. I, 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 Republicans got us to this point, right? I mean, the Bush administration was one of the great disasters of the 20th century. Um, <laughs> Could we insert Democrats into, into, into that response as well? <laughs> Could we I mean, do, do you have the same so, antipathy to the Democrats as you would the Republicans? I have a great antipathy towards the Democrats, because... Uh, I didn't want to leave them out, so no, I... We certainly wouldn't want to do that. No, no my view is that, that, that the problem today in Washington is spending, 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 and ad regulation, too much of it. And that the solution, and the only solution, is to cut, 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 and reduce the size and the scope, most importantly the scope, of government. And uh, you don't do that, and you can't do that by raising taxes. Now, there's stuff you can do with taxes, and we can talk about that. You know, the tax well, let's, hold today let's, let's hold off on the absurd, taxes for a moment. But it's we, not an issue of reason. We, we, we'll come back. Sure. Death and taxes will come, we'll cover all of, those, uh, all of those points. But I'd like to turn to David, because we've heard a very narrow view of, of government, and, and, I, and I think a fairly dramatic clash here between our two speakers, which is exactly what, we'd, what we had hoped for. Uh, Euron mentioned, mentioned the, the, uh, the, the philosophy behind government what the philosophy of our founding fathers work, you know, quoting John Locke, who, who rather famously said that our fundamental rights are life, liberty, and property. Yeah. Uh, followed by Thomas Jefferson, you might say, who as our country came together and replaced the word property with, one might argue, the pursuit of happiness. So I'm wondering if, there, if you have a comment on, on the, the basic view towards government in our society. Is it a property right? Is there a narrow view of government? Is that how government came to be as we know it in the United States? Well, I think government should be what Americans want it to be through our democracy and through the social contract. And I think Americans strongly support, for the most part, the government we have. Strong support for Social Security and Medicare. Strong support for a, a role in in uh, environmental protection, strong support for the FDA in a role in protecting us against bad food and drugs, strong support for uh, food stamps and uh, unemployment and other key elements of the social safety net, strong support for investing in infrastructure, strong support for having government play a proactive role in investing in science and ensuring that we keep up in global competition. We have the government that Americans want. This is not some kind of autocrats dictating to us you know, how your money should be, should be used. We, as a democratic society, have made these choices. Huron says that there is, that there is one aim of government. You, you said there were two. 
I mean, you said that, that, that the government should be there to protect us. And I think there might be some common ground, at least in your first element and, and Yaron's first, first element. Yours, I, I'm unclear as to your second point, frankly. You, you said you wanted to, that it was to address the question of capitalism. And I took it to mean that government should manage capitalism. Am I, am I right Absol in that regard? Absol absolutely. All right. How, what, what, is, what is the disagreement in terms of the protection element okay. between you and, and, and Yaron? Why don't you address it, David, I, I, and then I'll turn it back to you, Ron. Sure. I believe in a more expansive uh, role, as do most Americans, for government protecting us from a whole bunch of things, not just from street criminals, not just from foreign terrorists. Frankly, whether or not my, I, I lose money because my house is burglarized or I lose money because my financial investor rips me off because the Securities and Exchange Committee Commission has been downsized doesn't really matter to me. I've still lost the money. Whether I die because I'm uh, murdered or whether I die in a workplace accident because my employer is cutting corners doesn't matter. I want protection, as do most Americans, from a range of dangers that exist in modern society. Do Americans need to be protected in that way, Yaron? No. Well, so th this is the difference. I view force as something unique, something very different. It is something that people inflict on one another. And it is the one, in my view, enemy of human life. In my view, to, to, to be successful in life, to prosper as human beings, what we need is to be free to use our minds, to, to think, to reason, to solve problems, to, to engage with reality, choose between a variety of different options that are out there, make decisions. We need to be free. The one thing that obstructs our ability to think, when you have a gun stuck at the back of your neck, you're not thinking. You're doing what the guy's telling you. So the one thing that obstructs our ability to think, and therefore our ability to progress, to be successful, to pursue our life, to pursue our happiness, is force. So in my view, force is unique. It's not like uh, cancer. It's not like uh, a virus. It's not like... Uh, of voluntarily taking on a risk that maybe somebody else wouldn't. I believe that people should be allowed to take a variety of different risks. So force is unique and I want to ban it from society. And I want the government, the only thing I want the government to do is to ban it. Now, the example David gave was, it was a little fuzzy in the sense that we're both against fraud. We both believe that the government has a role to play in catching the frauds. There's indeed, I believe the SEC has only one role. If there should be an SEC, it has only one job. That's to catch Bernie Madoff. The reason it can't do that job, the reason it can't do that job, is because it's monitoring every transaction that I make. It's my, I have to file loads of paperwork. I'm an honest guy. I'm not cheating my clients like Bernie Madoff. But they have to monitor. I'm a crook in advance. They're just waiting to catch me. So they're so flooded with 13 Ds and 13 Gs and a million other forms that they don't have time to catch the real crook, which is Bernie Madoff. So we both agree the crooks, I think. We what about agree. catching Bernie Ebers, the CEO of WorldCom, who committed fraud? Yeah, and that's the job of the SEC. Oh, oh, that's the job of the police, however you want to call it. <laughs> catching crooks, catching people who defraud other people, is clearly the role of government. The role of government is not to be looking over everybody's shoulder to tell me what kind of transactions I can and cannot engage in, to tell me how much shares I should, can or cannot buy in a particular company, who can sit on a board and who can't sit on a board, who can invest in, in, in stuff. So when it's force, and I include fraud under force, that is where the government has a legitimate role to play. Let me, let me but ask there you is a fundamental difference between harm that occurs to us and between force. So, you know, for example, all these ideas about safety, I mean, the notion is that safety came from government. It came like manna from heaven. It just dropped on us. All the statistics show that safety improves in an industry dramatically. Government steps in, puts in regulations that improve it, continue that improvement, actually, actually reduce the rate of improvement uh, following that, following those introductions. Safety makes sense from a profit perspective. I, I know it's a shock to people who've never been in business. But it's not a profitable activity to kill your employees. It's not. Yaron, before, before you, before for, you proceed for any further, business. 
Let, let me, let me, uh, the, the statement has been made by David, and I want to give you an opportunity to sure. perhaps expand your comments. You've talked about some of uh, our financial system here. Yeah. He has suggested that capitalism needs to be managed. I, uh, would, you, would you care to comment on, on, that, on yeah. that statement? And we'll, we'll give David an opportunity to expand as well. But, but he says capitalism needs to be managed. That's a different concept, isn't it, than, than protection. Would you, would you like to address that from your yeah, point of view? Yes, so uh, 